This truth is fundamental to the teaching of God's Word. And it's unfortunate that so many in the church today do not have a clue about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and spirit and filling and spiritual fruit and, and being led by the Spirit. In fact, many cast aspersions on the whole thing about the Spirit-filled life like it's some weird thing just because they know some weird person that claims to be Spirit-filled. Lord God, you know all my ways. You know here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We're look forward, looking forward to getting into uh, the continuation of a series that we began here a few weeks ago. We thank you so much for being here and being a part of this. I had the occasion of bumping into several of you this past week. Sometimes we go for days, sometimes weeks, and that doesn't happen. But this past week was one of those glorious weeks where it just seemed like every time I turn around, somebody was saying, hey, we see you on the television, and we just uh, enjoyed the, the broadcast or the telecast. Well, you're why we're here. New Life Community Church and New Life Telecast is primarily established toward the end of telling people about Jesus the Christ, God's Son, Jesus Christ. Once that happens and once people establish a relationship with Christ, which is our hope and our prayer, then we trust that they would begin to grow and let their roots run down deep and grow in the things of God. So, the overarching thing of New Life Telecast is to preach and teach the Word of God so that newly established believers might grow. I trust you might be one of those. Here's something else I've discovered. Even after walking with the Lord for 35, well, actually 40 plus years, I still discover day by day that I can grow, that I can learn new things, that I can learn some new things about God and Christ and this walk with the Lord. And it's really exciting more exciting than anything I have ever done in this present life. And I've done been to carowinds and everything. Nothing beats this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, the teaching that we began a couple of weeks ago is one that deals with the issue of being spirit-filled. This is very fundamental to our walk with the Lord. Our text passage is taken out of Galatians chapter 5, and I'm going to read one verse in your hearing right now. And without further ado, we're going to jump right on into this. Let me remind you that the teachings that you hear on New Life Telecast are taped live at New Life Community Church each and every Sunday morning. Uh, you will note on occasion there's a, a backlog, so to speak. This particular series was preached live weeks ago, but you're hearing it now. And this is what we do at New Life. I trust you'll be encouraged and instructed by this. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. The record puts it this way. So I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Two distinct lifestyles presented here and we're going to develop this a little more as we get into it tonight. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for every person that has turned on this telecast tonight, uh, whether someone that's watched week after week or perhaps someone that's turned us on for the very first time tonight. I pray that in the power of the Spirit, by your word, that you would speak to our hearts, instruct us, encourage us, lift us up, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, you hang around here, give a listen, keep your Bibles handy, follow along, and Lord willing, we'll be back here in just about 27 minutes to wrap things up. Let me pray for you. Father God, as we bring before these folk today your word, I pray and ask in the name of Jesus that you would hide me behind the cross. And I pray that my words would be your words, that your words would be my words. And I pray, Lord, that our minds, our hearts, our spirits might be open to your eternal word today. Draw us to yourself in the power of the Spirit, we pray, we ask 
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you much. You might be seated. Oddly enough, I'm actually not speaking to you about the beef. We uh, talked to you about Miss Peller uh, a couple of weeks ago. You remember the lady, the where's the beef lady? Some of you will remember that. Some of you were just a twinkle in your mother's eye back in 1983 or so. Uh, when that came about, trust me when I tell you, it was hilarious. So, I'm not preaching on the beef, but I am asking a similar question. And that question is, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? Now, let me just give you a little intro and then a little summary from parts one and two. And then we're going to jump into part three today. And the intro and the summary won't hurt too bad. But let me see if we can catch you up to where we are for benefit of those of you who may not have caught parts one and two. Our text says clearly, you don't have to have the Greek, you don't have to twist this around, you don't have to find uh, some other perversion, but it says clearly, but the fruit of the Spirit is, and begins to tell us what that is, the fruit of the Spirit. Watch this. If Jesus Christ dwells in you by Holy Spirit, then the natural result of that, Holy Spirit comes to reside inside, the natural result of that indwelling will be the realization of these very virtues flowing forth, not only to you, in you, but from within you and out to others. Now, Pastor Terry, how does that work? Here in Galatians chapter 5, Paul presents two contrasting ways in which we might approach life. Watch this. Two contrasting ways in which we might approach life. Look at verse 16 of Galatians 5. He says, so I say, live by the Spirit. That's one way. And you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. That's the other way. Life influenced by Holy Spirit or life influenced by the sinful nature. You right now are living one way or the other. You're either living your life influenced by the Spirit or you're living your life influenced by the sinful nature. One is preferred over the other. One is actually natural in the sense that it's the way in which you came into this world. We went into a lot of detail in part two about that. I'm not going back into that detail. The second isn't natural, but rather supernatural, meaning you can't live it apart from the supernatural power of God. Many from the Old Testament to the New Testament and all in between have attempted it, but it can't be done. Listen, beloved. It is God's plan for you to live your life influenced by the supernatural power of God. It's God's plan for you to, to live life influenced by this supernatural power. And He has provided you Holy Spirit by which you might do so. Holy Spirit's not just some weird term, just some vague thing. Holy Spirit is for real and is of God. Now, watch this. Here is something of eternal importance. How many of you know that we have some important things, things that we have to do today, perhaps some things we have to do this week, perhaps some things that we think we need to do in this life, and then there are things of e eternal importance. Things that go on and on and on and will have an effect upon our eternity. Here's something of eternal importance. You cannot plan on going to heaven. And I won't ask by a show of hands how many of you are planning to go to heaven. I trust all of you are. But you cannot plan on going to heaven to live forever with God if you choose to continue living in this present world under the power and under the corruption and under the influence, yea, even the dom uh, domination of your old sinful nature. So it's important for you to understand two things. First of all, it's important for you to understand you can be set free from the domination of your sinful nature. And must be if you intend to spend eternity in heaven. And secondly, you, you need to understand just how you can be set free from your sinful nature. Just to wrap up this introduction, let me say this to you. 
This truth that we're talking to you about this morning is foundational to the gospel that Paul was purposed uh, in bringing forth by way of the Galatian letter. And you remember in the introduction we talked to you about he was really peeved because some people were perverting the gospel? Well, what I'm talking to you about this morning is very foundational to the gospel that he was so concerned about presenting to not only the Galatian people, but to us as well. This truth is fundamental to the teaching of God's Word. And it's unfortunate that so many in the church today do not have a clue about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and spirit in filling and spiritual fruit and, and being led by the Spirit. In fact, many cast aspersions on the whole thing about the Spirit-filled life like it's some weird thing just because they know some weird person that claims to be Spirit-filled. And you better watch it. Sometimes weird people do become filled with the Spirit. Hmm? Thank God that God doesn't just say, Hey, this Spirit in filling is for all the, the normal people. Every now and then He says, You know what, Jesus? Why don't we let Terry in on this? Now, to summarize a little further Part 1 and 2. Thus far we have discovered, we have discovered, we have uncovered this. That every last one of us in this room, regardless who you are, man, woman, boy, or girl, every one of us in this room knows about a life lived out under the influence of the sinful nature. We found out, uh, thanks to David the psalmist, we found out from chapter 51 that all of us come into this world, basically, we come into this world sinful at birth. David said even from the time his mother conceived him, by the time all those little things happened in his mother's womb. We've also discovered that the sinful nature is, the sinful nature is the fallen twisted nature by which we come into this physical world, the sinful nature. That sinful nature is the enemy of God. Now we're going to be talking about spiritual fruit, but I suggested to you in part two that before we talk about the spiritual fruit, we need to understand the enemy of the spiritual fruit. The sinful nature is the enemy of God, the enemy of spiritual fruit. And in the sense, it is in that sense, it is opposed to, to God. The sinful nature isn't for God. Do you understand being for something, promoting something, being in favor of something? The sinful nature isn't for God. It is totally against God. And I don't expect you to accept my uh, proclamation to that extent, but if you'll listen to the anointed one, uh, Paul, not the anointed one, but one who was anointed, one who was inspired, if you'll listen to Paul, Romans chapter 8, he says this in verse 7, the sinful mind... I'm going to talk to you about that sinful mind in just a moment. Stick with us. Because that sinful mind is influenced by the sinful nature. The sinful mind is hostile to God. Isn't that what it says? That word in the original means hatred, hostility. Some versions translate it as enemy. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. We've also discovered that the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 1, in verse 27, that God created humans good and without a sinful nature. Adam came into the world, created in the image and likeness of God without a sinful nature, but he messed that up. And as the head of the race, he messed that up. For all of us, for that reason, you and I have the sinful nature because of the willful disobedience, the willful disobedience of Adam and Eve. Romans chapter 5, verse number 12 makes that clear. I'm not going back there at this time. But I will say this as I transition from part 2 into part 3, and this is where we left you off last week. The fact that Adam willfully disobeyed God and his nature was twisted became fallen. That lends itself to this. From that time, for, from generation to generation, the sin nature has been passed down to and is passed down to all of humanity. Again, Romans chapter 5 makes that pretty clear. 
From that time on, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl uh, that's been born since the time of Adam has, if you please, inherited a dead, sinful nature. The sin nature manifested itself very, very early in the genealogy of Adam and Eve. You ever thought about that? The very first child born to Adam and Eve was who? Hello, is anybody here? I hate preaching to a room full of empty people. Almost said empty heads. That wouldn't be accurate, would it? Hang on here. Adam and Eve's first son was Cain. You know what happened with Cain? Cain became Cain became the very first murderer. Very early in the genealogy, this sinful nature manifested itself. He became the very first murderer. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 4. Have you ever considered that murder is the most self-centered crime, the most self-centered sin there is? Murder? Because as a murderer, you establish yourself as the judge, the jury. You set yourself up as God. Something that is reserved for God, uh, the, the murderer accepts that responsibility for themselves and it's wrong, deeply wrong. Now we also discovered that Adam and Eve did not die physically when they committed this sin. But they did die Spiritually, their spiritual nature died. And we'll talk to you some more about that in just a moment. So, let's recap. Pay attention, class. Pastor, you're saying, I come into this world with a sinful nature. I have a sinful nature. But, thank God, Pastor... <laughs> My neighbor also has a sin nature. So I'm not oddball in this. And you're telling me, Pastor, that, that all of humanity comes into the world with a sin nature. I have a sin nature. Neighbors have a sin nature. People that I don't even know have a sin nature. People that were born centuries ago have a sin nature. If the, the Lord tarries, those people are going to have a sin nature. So what's the big fat deal? What's the big deal? Let me see if I can explain it to you like this. Fill in number one with me on your notes. Very practically. How many of you know that I'm not here to impress you on Sunday, but to be very practical? Okay? That's my calling. To help you understand stuff, not try stuff, as Sister Donna would say, not try to wow you. I do that on purpose. Very practically. Our sinful nature, I told you just a few moments ago, I was going to tell you more about this. Here it is. Our sinful nature influences our soul. Watch this. The soul, the soulish realm is the mind, the will, the emotions. Our sinful nature that we come into this world with influences our soul, our mind. Influences the way we think. How many of you here this morning have been guilty of thinking at some point in time this week. That's what I thought about half of you. In fact, Pastor, I'm not even going to think right now, if you mind. Yeah. The sinful nature influences the way we think. It inclines our minds to rebel against God. And again, I do not even remotely expect you to take my word for that. Look at this. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 5 says, Those who live according to the sinful nature, influenced by the sinful nature, have their what, church? Mind set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The sinful nature can and does influence or incline our minds to rebel against God. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires as opposed to what God desires. Can I see your eyeballs? Are you concerned about what God desires for your life? Are you? You see, the sinful nature is not concerned about that. The sinful nature is concerned about what 
it thinks. The sinful nature is concerned about human comfort and human drives and just absolutely the opposite of what God desires. Now, let me give you just a little, little parentheses here. What I have just told you about the sinful nature influencing our mind, that can be very, very subtle, or subtle rather, when measured against our own standard. Watch this. This can be very subtle when measured against our own standard. I come into the world with a sin nature. My neighbor has a sin nature. Everybody has a sin nature. So if I measure all, uh, all of this about the sin nature by my own standard or by my neighbor's standard or the world's standard, you see how subtle it would be or how difficult it may even be to recognize that this is there? Does that make sense a little bit? It's very subtle. Proverbs 12 and 15 says this. I want you to understand this about what man thinks and about what's going on around us and the, the current cultural philosophy, if you please. Rome, uh, Proverbs 12 and 15 says, The way of fools, somebody say fool. The way of fools seems right to them. Isn't that true? How many of you know a fool? If you know too many people today, or, or very many people today, you know some fools, I'm telling you. Mor moronos, a moron. You, see, we have people who are ignorant, who don't know any better. But once you tell someone who is ignorant better, and they purpose, purposefully, willfully continue to do it, they've crossed over from being ignorant to being a moron. And then when they form a club and start arguing for moronic behavior, they become... Pretty foolish. Are you with me? Does that make sense? We see it all the time on the evening news. We see these groups all the time. It says the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Listen to chapter 14, verse 12 from the old King James Version. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Ezekiel said this, Yet the Israelites say, The way of the Lord is not just. Are my ways unjust, people of Israel? Is it not your ways that are unjust? Can you imagine a man shaking his fist in the face of God, saying, God, your ways are unjust. The most just God, the God of justice. And people shaking their fist in his face and saying, You are unjust. Oh my goodness. Isaiah says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Beloved, the Bible makes clear that we can't be a little bit for God while at the same time a little bit for other gods, other gods, including the God of self. Now man tends to, to lean into this. Man tends to think, oh, it's not so bad if I dabble around with a little of this God and a little of that God. God won't mind if I do that. Lean into our own understanding. We can't purpose to be a little bit sinful and yet a little bit righteous. Listen to the Bible. Exodus 20 tells us, do not make any gods, little g, to be alongside me. Do not make for yourselves gods of silver or gods of gold. Who said that? God said that. Uh, chapter 34, verse 14 of Exodus, do not worship any other god, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. A righteous jealousy. A jealousy that is founded in goodness and love, and mercy, and hope, and everything righteous. Isaiah says this, I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another, or my praise to idols. The sinful mind is hostile, is, is rebellious toward God. So says God. Well, beloved, here's a great way for us to wrap up the program tonight, and that is by reiterating this to you. Have you been born again? Now, I realize there's a lot of things you could be watching on television tonight, and you may be looking for your remote right now, trying to say, let me get out of here. 
But there's nothing that you'll listen tonight that would be more important than answering this question. Have you, you personally, been born again, born anew of the Spirit of God? We hear a lot of phraseology and terminology thrown around today in and around the church. And sometimes those of us who are a part of the body of Christ, the church, or the fellowship, we get so used to so to, uh, Christian ease, so to speak, that we forget that there are some people who may not be familiar with what we're talking about. But being saved is being born again, being born anew of the Spirit. As we have tried to explain in this teaching, we come into this world with a problem, with a sin problem, and we can't go to heaven with that sin problem. It has to be taken care of. And that is taken care of through the second birth or being born again, born anew of the Spirit. I believe the Bible teaches very simply that we must confess our sins. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. We must repent of our sins. Lord, I am sorry enough about this that I'm going to do my part to stop sinning. Now, the old flesh is going to have something to say about that. But that's where being born again is so, so important. We believe that as we open up our heart's door and confess and repent that Jesus comes in and forgives us of our sins, creates a, a new person inside of us, and we begin to live by that new person. We believe that as we receive Christ into our life, then we begin the mind-renewing process. You say, well, Pastor Terry, that sounds awful complicated. Well, mechanically, it isn't very complicated. God changes us on the inside, begins to speak to us by His Spirit from the inside, and we just simply bring our mind into that which we're hearing and come into agreement with that which we're hearing on the inside. We do that by reading and understanding the Bible, the Word of God. It's not very complex at all. Now listen, those of you that have tuned us in tonight, you know whether you've been born again or not. On occasion, someone says to me, well, I don't know. I think I have. Listen, you'll know if you've been born again. It didn't happen by accident. It's not like you're walking along and you stump your toes. Oh, I must be born again. No, you will know there will be a change inside. And I encourage you to follow through and discover the truth and the reality of this born-again experience that the Bible teaches. I'd love to talk to you more about that myself or someone here at New Life. There is a number appearing there on the screen. If you'd give us a call, uh, we'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have or try to walk you through this. Uh, also, our web address is right there. There's a lot of valuable information on our website. The teachings that you hear on New Life, they are linked to our website. The study notes are there. We are here to help. Please don't just sit there and wonder about these things. We are saying to you, hey, we would like to help. We want you to understand the Word of God, the Bible, and we're here to help you understand that. That's what we're all about. Father, I thank you for those that have turned us on tonight, and I pray specifically for that one who may be in the television audience tonight that for the very first time has confessed their sins and repented of their sins. They have opened their heart's door and invited you to come in to be their Lord, their Savior, their forgiver. And as they receive you, I pray that you would do this life-changing work inside them and help them, Lord, as they begin this walk with you, we pray in Jesus' name. I do want to remind you before we go off the air tonight, in particular, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, New Life Community Church meets each and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, and we would love to see you here. We also have midweek activities Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, something for nearly every member of the family, and that just might include you. Those who are born again, and I believe this, when you're born again, born into the kingdom of God, you connect with the church, the body of Christ, the called out ones. So stop making excuses. Get connected with a church and come to know and love the fellowship of the body of Christ. My time's gone. I've almost talked too much tonight. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a great week. And remember, my friends, if you don't live it, you don't have it. Lord God.